Hello, I'm Jennifer Shanker, Editor-in-Chief of The Innovator. Welcome to the session on innovation in infrastructure. So now, um, without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our panelists. We are joined uh, by Marie Lam Fredo, CEO of the Global Infrastructure Hub, who is joining us from Sydney, Australia. Philippe Delorme, Executive Vice President and CEO of Schneider Electric's um, energy management business, who is joining us from Hong Kong. Sridhar Gadhi, uh, founder and CEO of Quintella, a World Economic Forum 2019 technology pioneer, who is joining us from Hyderabad, India. And Nielsen Kufus, co-founder of Nomoko, uh, a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Innovators Community, who is joining us from Zurich, Switzerland. So, um, Marie, let's start the discussion with you. You head up an organization that was specifically appointed by the G20 to look at how um, we can innovate infrastructure to help um, meet the global goals. Your organization is organizing a global challenge to entrepreneurs and innovators to, um, to see how we can innovate to, to make things better. The winners won't be announced until Thursday of this week. Um, so without giving away the store, could you give us a sneak peek at the kind of innovations that are being proposed? and? which you think are the most promising. Yeah, thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, good morning and afternoon and evening to uh, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, so as Jennifer mentioned, uh, we last year at the Global Infrastructure Hub is indeed a, a G20 uh, entity, the solely G20 entity dedicated to infrastructure. Um, beyond the work that we're actually doing for the G20 itself on helping them to adopt uh, uh, new principles uh, for Infratech. That was actually what we endorsed this year in July uh, under the Saudi presidency. We are also working directly with the private sector as one key part of our mandate, which is to bridge the public and the private sector. So um, really taking into consideration that there is not enough of those bottom-up solutions that are actually really visible to policymakers. We took on the charge to really launch this Infra Challenge. So the idea was to launch a global innovation competition uh, for the infrastructure community. And the competition called for digital innovations that can be applied to solve economic, social infrastructure issues and build momentum towards a better infrastructure, which is another topic that we work very actively at the G20. Uh, so we received, we started this process in September last year. Uh, we received more than almost 100 applications from over 30 countries. And actually this week we'll be uh, announcing that we'll have a finale on Thursday where we'll be announcing the winner. Uh, the Info Challenge Top 10 will be pitching their technology solutions um, and during that, that event. And so, so giving you a bit of a, of a feel of what happened from running this Info Challenge during a pandemic, which was obviously not our, what everybody expected when we started the competition, it's really been amazing to see the breadth of innovation that could be applied across the infrastructure industry. So uh, from using drones to inspect assets, uh, AI to automate design, to increasing accessibility with Internet of Things or using data to manage risk better and inform decision-making, we've seen really a, a plethora of fantastic ideas. Uh, one thing that we noticed through running the, uh, the competition is that in terms of sector, uh, energy sector and, and the big move towards renewable seems to have shown a greater and a faster adoption uh, of technology than most of the other infrastructure sector. Overall, I mean, uh, infrastructure is a very low tech adopter. Um, and um, it's been really uh, in the recent years, really, that it's led the way in technology advances in renewable energy and using AI for better human management. So if we're looking at also what type of the issue that we are trying to solve with this, uh, with the specific ideas and with the specific um, uh, startups that we've been supporting, I would say I could think about two main problems that we've been trying to address and 
for which we've actually received a very interesting application. First is technology can help uh, with enabling uh, the, the sustainable goals through data that allows for better decision making across the entire project lifecycle. So uh, it enables EI and predictive analytics, which helps in project prioritization and in optimizing asset performance during the O&M stage. And one example could be uh, wastewater treatment optimization. So there are technologies out there that can automatically optimize wastewater treatment performance in terms of quality and energy consumption. Conventionally, this would have been done more for trial and error. Um, so overall, this a new technology helps to reduce operational costs, reduce the risk of non-compliance with environmental regulation. It also takes out the risk of human error, uh, which is common in really highly complex and specialized processes. So to do this, high quality data needs to be available to generate high quality analytical output. The second uh, big issue that we've been really trying to look at and, and what technology could support um, making some changes has been really um, technology like um, that investor will get greater confidence in investing in sustainable infrastructure. So to um, a good example would be for digital twins. Uh, so digital twins uh, utilize data from IoT devices and other data sources to provide an electronic version of a physical asset, which can be updated actually in real time. Uh, and for asset manager and investors, there will be greater visibility on how their assets are performing and how they can be optimized. So, so that was to just give you a bit of a glance of the technology that we, we came across, and there are actually many more. So hopefully you could join uh, later on this week to listen more uh, about those pitches directly. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Marie mentioned that we're seeing uh, innovation, uh, a lot of innovation in the energy sector. Um, so I think that's a great segue to you, Philippe. Um, uh, the energy sector is responsible for around two thirds of the total greenhouse gases uh, admitted um, around the world. So we won't be able to um, uh, tackle climate change and help solve the SDGs without your sector. What are some of the innovations that uh, Schneider Electric uh, uh, is seeing? Thanks, Jennifer. And hi, everyone. Pleasure to be with, with every one of you today. So as you said, uh, energy accounts actually for 80% of the carbon emissions. So it's central to any SDG agenda. Remind everyone, the goal by 2050 to be carbon neutral. No more carbon in anything, starting with energy. So that calls for a massive transformation. And a massive transformation has to go into focused topics so that we can be effective. Our approach has been to look at where the big, big masses. And what you see in city infrastructure is that 70% uh, or city infrastructure account for 70% of the emission. So 70% of 80% of that problem. So you, you go very quickly to the Pareto of where the problem is and where actually 50, 55% of people are living today in cities. And by 2050, this, this urbanization rate is going to go to 70%. So let's say everything is converging towards making really cities and infrastructure work in a very different way, very fast, because we have no time to act. So we, we've done our, our homework to look at what would be the technology that are driving that transformation at the forefront of that transformation. One is digitization. Uh, Marie has been uh, talking about it. And I'll try to build on that to give further example. Second one that actually not enough people are talking about is the move to electrification because electrification brings a much more efficient energy and can flow energy that's not carbonated. And the goal is to get rid of carbon. So in that context, electrification and digitization are the two uh, enablers of the transformation for sustainable and efficient and resilient agenda. So let's take two examples, one in the grid, which is an important topic of the energy equation because in that whole transformation, there will be more renewable, there will be more instability in the grid, and the grid has to become much more agile. And we believe, thanks to digital technology, this will have electricity as, or energy is, uh, is, uh, is very hard to store. And the, the way to counter that is to make sure that grids become agile. 
and grid will become agile if they get more digital so that you can get real time data about how the grid is working, understand on the grid where points of consumption and production will be able to trade as we do kind of the internet to make it very, very flexible and very agile. So that's one field of drastic revolution where I would say post COVID, we see many utilities moving very fast to digital technology, one for resilient purposes, because they realize that they need to remote control those assets, second for sustainability purpose. So that's one. Then in building, which accounts for 40% of the carbon footprint in the world, there is a massive revolution that's happening out of a sector that has been historically very low in innovation because very low in digitization. I think McKinsey was doing a report a few years ago showing that the level of digitization in building construction was very low and therefore the level of productivity and innovation was very, very low because the two correlates very well. Again, in building, we want to drive more electrification because it's the most efficient energy and more digitization to drive efficiency, agility and sustainability. And we think the way to do it is to do, to do this across the full life cycle. Uh, again, Marie was talking about this at the beginning of the design and build phase, where actually that's the starting point of driving a different agenda. There is a lot of technology happening today on simulation and in the construction phase, software that would allow people to take 3D model and really do a much better job to drive construction in a very efficient manner. That's what people call BIM 4D and 5D. That's a gigantic revolution that's happening now. And that's, that's calling for faster adoption. Then you move to what we call O&M, Marie was talking about it, operate and maintain phase where thanks to AI, thanks to digital, uh, there are many things we can automate in the field of building, uh, how to deal with HVAC, which is 50% of the energy spent in a building. Uh, so the heating and cooling, the lighting, uh, the whole water network and so on, to automate uh, the way those buildings are operating so that actually they become more comfortable, uh, more livable, but also way more efficient and more resilient because they would be remotely controlled. So a vast ocean of technology, which actually can be applied in building to new build, but also to retrofit. They don't have to be very expensive. And, you know, digital in the existing building stock, which is today the vast majority of what we have to deal with for the coming 20 years, putting in place what we call active energy efficiency, digital technology is actually not complicated. It's simplifying by the day because technology is coming, AI, uh, more cost-effective connectivity, more business model that drive more services that make us hopeful in the end that actually technology do exist today, not tomorrow. Now, people might talk about, let's say, future technology, hydrogen, which maybe is going to come in 30 years, meaning too late. Today, technology around electrification and digitization are available today. And really, the question is, how do we scale it, scale up as fast as we can to make the goal of 2050, which is an absolute must for all of us? Thank you very much, Philippe. So I'd like to now move to uh, Nielsen, because um, both Marie and Philippe kind of touched on the importance of digital twins and simulation. Uh, and so um, um, I would like you to tell, uh, tell us um, how Namoko is tackling that issue. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this was a beautiful introduction and, and both of uh, Mari and, and Philip, they already touched on it. And I just want to give the, the viewership maybe um, a quick also conceptual overview what what is actually happening on that front. So um, the word, the buzzword digital twin already has um, kind of fallen in that sense. Um, this is in the end the digital infrastructure, which all of this automation and, and bringing basically digitization um, to the physical world is actually um, the, the basis and the infrastructure for. Um, as a definition of a digital twin, you essentially have a, a digital representation of a physical object, um, first coined by GE, General Electric, and um, applied to turbines, but we as a company applying this uh, literally to entire cities or entire countries. Um, so what in the end you have is um, you have a, a digital replica, meaning you have um, IoT data, you have 3D data, you have 
conceptual data, such as, for instance, for a house, you would have uh, the price of a house, you would have the legal data, what is the zoning law of a house, you would have um, consumption data, you would have demographics, traffic information, which is flowing around. Um, and I think the big shift that the digital twin is bringing is to actually bring all of this data, which in the end is linked to a physical place or a physical location into one database, which is then um, joined together and is also usable by many different applications. Um, so today, a lot of this data is living in very different silos and different kind of um, sectors and different um, entities, different companies. The state has a lot of this data, um, but the whole purpose of a digital twin is to bring this in a meaningful way together and then also make it accessible. So only if, if this digital twin, and, and I think this is what Murray said already very well, has very good data, any of the digitization and any of the automation um, that Ed Philip talked about is actually possible because you can rely that this data is actually representing um, a state of a physical object or a physical infrastructure. So it's super, super important to make this very clear that the data which is going into this digital twin is basically the bottom line and how good any optimization and automation and digitization can be. If the data is not correct, then anything you automate will also not be correct. Um, and then the second part is to make this really accessible. So um, I think I'm a big believer that today um, software will actually help um, through a digital twin to solve some of the biggest problems that we face as a society, especially the problems which are linked to the physical world um, from, um, of course, a lot within the, within the sustainable um, kind of ecosphere, um, but also when it comes to distribution of wealth through real estate and so on. Um, but the really important part is that this has to be accessible to a lot of um, companies and cannot be accessible only to a few. Um, so this has, like the internet back then, um, kind of democratized this actual access to digital um, technologies. This has to be accessed by a lot of people that startups, large companies, individuals, governments alike can use this digital twin and build their solutions on top of it and build their software stack on, on top of that digital twin, which is then the foundation of this. And I think um, making this really accessible is going to be one big key, um, key to success um, in terms of automating the physical world and in terms of helping the physical world with digital tools. Um, if this is not accessible to a lot of people and a lot of companies, this is not gonna be um, as disruptive as the internet was. Um, and for us as a company, we really see this as the kind of comparison, the digital twin is essentially the internet um, of the physical world as such um, and makes it possible to digitize on that front. Thank you very much for that fascinating overview of the near world that is uh, that is to is being developed um, uh, connecting all of our physical infrastructure. So sweetheart, let's now turn to Quantella and um, you are very much focused on what Philippe very rightly pointed out is uh, one of the biggest um, areas to tackle and that is cities and um, you know how to manage them more efficiently. Um, now, there, the, there are many environmental concerns, but there are also health concerns. Can you tell us um, how Quintella is working with cities uh, during the COVID pandemic? Sure. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, hello, everyone. Technology is playing a huge role in uh, cities, both efficiency as well as in the environment. Especially last few years, there is a leapfrog growth because there is a huge adoption of IoT devices, video, vision, and sensors. It made it its much more maturity, adoptability, and affordability of those technologies is going to really helping cities to adopt those technologies. Especially with COVID, the digitization is going to accelerate very fast because of the COVID, you know, working from home or education from home or e-health, there is a huge digital divide. Today, there are 60% of the people doesn't have proper internet to study from home. That's going to bring, you know, technology is not only going to bring opportunity, but also bring to bring challenges where you need to provide equal opportunity in terms of technology for all. So I feel that there is a huge opportunity. Uh, two reasons I can tell you. One, it's extremely affordable. 
unlike before where cities has to invest huge amount of money to bring those technologies there is a huge economic advantage of bringing this technology you talk about lighting philip to spoke about lighting by making lighting smart you can save 50% of the energy i'll give you one example in us one of the city said hey certain area of the city we are getting less academic rankings this place and they did a research they found out that certain area doesn't have internet available so kids has to go back to school to do the homework so what we did is we made lighting smart we made that savings that savings and the same infrastructure is invested making wifi freely available for the students so that's how uh, the investments into cities can be self sustainable where private parties can come and invest and create the value both economical environmental and social and create the value and you spoke about the health uh, when this covid happened most of the smart city platforms all over the world really not much focused on the health when this happened the head of the country uh, who focuses on this said that hey can you make this smart city platforms into city war room platforms so within 72 hours we we made our technology platform into war room platforms which is today helping around 27 cities and two countries level as well as several state governments so what we have done is you know it's not done by one department you need so much of data collections from police department health department social welfare department disaster management how do you took all this data to man- monitor what's happening how do they collaborate among the different departments so that they can help citizens better how do you prevent from not happening so that you can have this lockdown zones where there is a higher spread so that you can plan it out and you can predict you know the cases and you can make sure that the health infrastructure is available at a right time so it played a huge role there as well thank you very much um as follow up question um i'd like to talk about how it's not just innovation in technology but also innovation in business models that will help move things forward and if i'm not mistaken your companies business model is based on success so if you help a city for example become more energy efficient they pay you only based on the results is that right absolutely so uh, typical models used to be earlier cities used to invest into infrastructure then the country level said that okay we will participate to certain extent but today there is huge amount of ppp models are emerging in the technology as you rightly mentioned energy have huge amount of savings so which means that we have partnered with a fund which invests into the project anti digitization and you operate it create one revenue models two savings and whatever the savings you make there will be shared you know the value will be given back to the investor who is investing into it then after certain years city not only have to spend less they will also make more revenues because they have less cost of energy the same thing we have done for parking we have done for safety and several of them thank you and nielsen i'll ask you uh, um for your company nomoko how are you enabling some new digital business models that help tie together the physical and digital worlds yeah i think um uh, this is a really important factor right because in the end any any technology or any um in that sense innovation is always only going to be as adopted as fast as you create um a monetary ecosystem around it as well right so if we have we've seen this in the past if we have a technology or or any innovation which doesn't provide in the end business value and doesn't provide economic value the adoption will be much much slower um i think for for us this all ties into having um collaborative business models or participatory business models in that sense so in the end i think the the the, the old model where you have these giants which then in the end uh, monetize the data which has been collected by others um indirectly i think that's something which is not going to be sustainable for these type of models so in the end if you if you also say that data collection is something which is very important and the quality of data really matters 
you need to also incentivize the data collectors to participate in the economies of those ecosystems as well. And likewise, you need to have the people who um, in the end bring the business outcome in that sense and they have to participate as well. So for us, it's all about um, having participatory business models, which then in the end also has to be chosen by the actors. So if, if someone is um, launching a product which is or, or a solution which has a SaaS business model and pays data and a part of that, then this is the business model they choose. If someone else is choosing a business um, business outcome as a service um, model where they participate in the amount of money saved, um, then this is the business model for that particular application. But the ones who are linked to it need to participate in that um, particular business model too. So um, if you can create um, participatory um, economies or, or ecosystems, then everyone profits in the end. Um, and then you really have a truly um, disruptive um, ecosystem. Um, where no one is exploited within that, um, but all, everyone is participating in the success. And I think this is how you align the interests um, among this. Thank you, Nielsen. Um, Philippe, let me um, turn to you to, um, to ask you about what kind of innovation and business models Schneider Electric has seen. Sure. So first of all, let's uh, reminder of the past episode of what we, we've covered. Uh, first point is really technology do exist. So that's a real good point. I mean, we're all looking at the problem we have to solve. Start, starting from the point that technology do exist is really an exciting starting point because now really the point is how do we scale up? So indeed, uh, one is to keep fueling the technology innovation. There is more to come, great. Second one is really to see how to scale up things. And in that context, uh, this Innovation in business model is really important. On that one, I would quote two uh, examples of stuff that uh, we've been driving at Schneider. One is uh, a business model innovation where we saw a gap of funneling money to sustainable projects. Uh, uh, I mean, there are, there are papers saying that there is a global gap of close to three trillion of invest of, of financing to those sustainable investment and what we did was to partner with a financial institution namely the Carlyle uh, group to form a company where Schneider would bring the skill set and the capability to deliver project and Carlyle will deliver uh, funds and actually the capacity to uh, structure bigger project we form a company together called Alpha Structure and we we work together to uh, propose our skill our combined skill set in front of big projects, one of them being the, the, um, <clears throat> the whole retrofit of JFK Airport in New York, which actually we secured as a project, where everybody wins because, uh, let's say, New York City and the whole uh, state is having in front of him this time money, skill sets that take full responsibility to deploy a project like this. So an interesting example of real business innovation at scale. Second one is actually a partnership we form with Walmart. Uh, we have a real good practice of energy consultant that would help companies like Walmart to optimize their carbon footprint. And actually, not only we work with Walmart, but we work with all the footprint of the supply of Walmart because every company has to go on scope one, two, and three. And, and we went after what we call a gigaton PPA program, power purchase agreement, where we consulted Walmart, but we also help Walmart help their suppliers to go after a giant goal of one gigaton of CO2 saving uh, for, for, the, for the company of the whole footprint, which is really innovation at scale. So that's technology, but that's also business model. So many, many solutions available today from a technology standpoint and business model. Okay, thank you very much. So now let's, we've talked about the opportunities. We've talked about how digital and other things like electrification can help uh, move things forward. But we also have to acknowledge that the, in the infrastructure space, there are many challenges. Um, it is hugely expensive uh, to retrofit some things. Um, and, you know, who is going to pay for all of this? Marie, what do you see as some of the, the biggest challenges that have to be overcome? And what is, you know, what, what in your mind are the one or two things that 
industry actors could do to help overcome those challenges? So um, in terms of challenges, obviously, the situation where we are, we are in, where we don't see enough scale up sufficiently fast, is obviously a combination of challenges. And I would probably um, mention four of them. Um, the, the first one is really about the procurement process, because today, when you look at an infrastructure project, it's still uh, the procurement process, the tender is very still, unfortunately, still led by um, uh, dragging down costs. And despite technology could support, obviously, uh, a cost reduction of the lifespan of the asset, it's too often seen as, a, as an upfront risk that would potentially uh, incur a bit more capex. But I think also the OPEX vision is probably not put forward sufficiently well. Um, so not enough incentive, if you want, to really put innovation within the core of this large project that will help actually to make this kind of proof of concept at scale. The second one is that obviously scaling technology projects is a bit difficult. Uh, and we know that it, it was great to hear uh, about the, um, uh, the, the projects that uh, Schneider Electric's got with Kyle along GFK Airport, uh, where they were able to work together, but this is obviously one big corporate working with a large uh, infra tech, um, uh, sorry, infra fund so uh, having both like-minded objectives related to ESGs, trying to make it work. But how then do you bridge really this kind of startups, VC world with the infrastructure project is, is another one. Mm -hmm. Another one is obviously our the culture and uh, uh, towards innovation in our industry. I mean, it's really one of the main barrier is that, uh, you know, it's really about the implementation of a technology around what will be the uncertainty of the outcomes. Um, and generally, this is a quite a risk averse uh, uh, industry, infrastructure as a whole. Uh, and so obviously it is risky, uh, but I think it's also important, especially with the challenges that we have seen uh, unfolding through the pandemic to start thinking differently and start embracing some other risk because we actually, uh, uh, there are lots of ways now to quantify them a bit better. Uh, and the last one is really the, uh, uh, and it's actually coming from a research that we did this year supporting the G20 InfraTech agenda uh, that we work on throughout the year to really identify some of those barriers. And one that came pretty uh, uh, clearly was, um, a, especially with the public sector, was about the awareness of what InfraTech and technology for infrastructure is all about, and also education aspects. Uh, so... Part of this for me, there is two components to that. It's uh, we tried that really through the Infra Challenge to raise awareness about what tech companies could do, who they are, how does it work? Uh, and then the other thing that we did was actually to work out um, use cases for um, technology and infrastructure that have already been proven to work and have a lot of examples already out there. So we compiled for the G2060 use cases uh, that are really um, from all of the AI uh, for, um, uh, you know, for example, in transport currently that can even help the pandemic uh, really um, down to, um, you know, how you could actually optimize this, this wastewater uh, throughout the entire process. So 60 different use cases that's going to be published uh, later on this year. Uh, but I think that was another way to actually bring this to governments to say you might not be aware of it, but that actually works. So it is time for you to think about this within your procurement processes, which Leads me to the two actions because, well, we've been hearing about uh, from, from my fellow panelists about some great ideas and, and actually model that works. So, you know, those challenges uh, could be definitely overcome. And I would say probably two call for actions in here is for governments really to streamline into their processes, more innovation, ask for it, incentivize innovation within the bids. Too often, even in developed countries, we don't see enough of that. So that requires then that the entire process for procurement is actually revised. So that's actually some work. So again, the work we've done at the G20 has hopefully informed uh, for the case for technology and infrastructure. Um, and then the second bit will be, how do you support better? I would say this valley of the death of uh, the financing for technology uh, between, again, the startups that are coming into accelerator and going into VCs and, and then how you get to the proof of concept and then get really scaled up uh, by uh, being really utilized in large infrastructure projects. So uh, in there, I think we've heard the model from, uh, uh, from my colleague in Schneider Electric, but there is also now a growing conscience about the fact that having InfraTech fund, but actually funds that could 
really focus on um, financing projects with an, a technology component, strong technology component, and really structure, I mean, actually de-risking really this technology component and support uh, the technology development and then pairing this InfoTech fund with actually some infrastructure funds. So there are a couple of projects that are um, uh, InfoTech fund that are in the, in the make. So hopefully we will see more of them in the next month. That's great. Thank you so much, Marie. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Sweetheart, from, from a startup's per perspective, what do you see as the biggest challenge and what action would you like to see taken by the actors in the industry to make it easier for startups to collaborate with big infrastructure players? So you're talking about the startups working with the corporates, right? That's the, the challenge or the overall as a smart cities to execute the challenge? Well, the actually both, because uh, on the one hand, in order to scale uh, some of these technologies, I, I think it is going to be necessary for startups to work with large corporates. On the other hand, you know, startups like yours are working with government. So what are the challenges that you face in, you know, in, in getting uh, governments to um, procure your services? Sure. See, the, the first challenge when you do smart city of any urban infrastructure digitization, usually it requires multi-stakeholders to work together. If you are working with municipality or with police, it's not enough. So if you are trying one, if you're trying to solve one problem, you need three to four departments to work together as a nodal agency. That's one challenge which at a policy level has to be solved. Second, there is still concern of security and data privacy. There is huge value for cities to create open data platform open it for startups like us to create very innovative business models but the policy making is still not firm i know world economic forum is working on creating the global data policy that still is not firm so once it is done there is a huge opportunity and the third is interoperability because every technology people developed by startups talk in different language so interoperability and having a standard language is also very important. Coming back to startups working with the corporates, working with the government, what we have done is we partnered with major system integrators. We partnered with major OEMs like Cisco, HP. So they go to the customer and our technology becomes part of their technology. Suddenly when I work with companies like Cisco, 10,000 sales organization of them is trying to sell my technology because I'm complementary to them. I'm providing my complementary technology embedded in their technology. Great, thank you. Nielsen, I know open data platforms is close to you. Um, and so do you, uh, if you have something to add on that, please please do. But also you, you're working with uh, the real estate industry and other um, actors in the infrastructure space. What would you like to see changed? Yeah, I mean, I think um, to add to this, I mean, the, the the big change needs to happen is the affordability, and I think this goes into the whole question of scale, right? Um, the the possibility you don't have to run through POCs and all of this; it just has to get much more commoditized, much more productized. I think this is what I want to see from the startups, um, to have these products up and running, ready, and um, that then you can also easily implement them into those um, into those infrastructure projects. And I think this is exactly what we're doing with the. The real estate industry, where in the end we said we cannot have a custom solution for every single um, real estate um, owner or for every in the end for every government. Um, this really has to be a standardized product, which can be rolled out also basically out of the box, right? This this cannot be a, a thing where then you have to customize this with every single solution, but it has to be um, productized enough um, to roll it out fast. Um, I just want to add to the to the governments. I think there's um, for us we see this in a way that the governments are partners. Um, they're not clients. They're partners because we as a startup we're not focusing on on getting government contracts running. If the government is the one who's paying in the end for that infrastructure, I think we're going to have a very long run at implementing them. I think you have to provide enough value to the private economy. There is players who say, you know what, this is valuable enough for me as a private player within this, 
Um, the government is part of that because they provide a lot of data and there's a lot of legislative kind of issues as well, because in the end, if you really automate on a city scale, some of those uh, parts, it becomes a question of, of legal liability. So if you automate traffic flow, for instance, and in the end, there is a massive traffic jam happening, is it your liability as a company who automated that? Or is it maybe someone else's fault? And um, so that's where we see governments much more as partners than as financial contributors to this ecosystem. So we'd like to take from a financial point of view, the governments out, see them as partners, data providers, um, legislation providers if necessary, uh, but the private economy needs to have a use case which is productizable and monetizable enough that um, this can basically work without the government's um, intervening. Thank you. Um, we're getting close to the end. Philip, do you have anything that you wanna add real quickly there in terms of a challenge? Cool. Yeah, or maybe call to action because we, we are close to the end, just to be super practical. <clears throat> so we've talked about a lot of stuff, but on our side, maybe two points we would like to highlight. One, clearly that scale up will not happen without a massive ability of companies to collaborate together, work together. Big companies with big companies, big companies with government and big companies with smaller startups, especially, I would say, that piece of uh, the two type of companies, the small and nimble and the bigger one, from time to time less nimble, is in my view a, a critical part. So a call to action and actually a call for help for any anybody that's watching us and that would like to engage with Schneider. We have a dedicated team called Innovation at the Edge, which can either invest or support those companies. We are hungry to engage more. Uh, as Schneider, and we really welcome. So you have my name, you can contact me on LinkedIn, and I'll pass you, uh, I'll, I'll put you in touch with my colleague who is driving that, but be call, call to action here, and we want to drive more collaboration and more ecosystem, number one. Number two, uh, for people who are watching us who are business leaders, I just would like to insist that we have all a personal, and I would say moral responsibility to transform. We always like to look at government and my neighbor and whatever. Personally, we all have a role to play to transform and take responsibility. Uh, so for people who are business leaders, we as Schneider believe that our duty is to drive sustainability and to help our customers do so. So if you are a CEO of a small company, mid-sized company, big company, we want to be on your side to help you drastically reduce your carbon footprint. And we believe we have the capability to help you there. And we are passionate about that. That's what keeps me up at night every day. That's what makes my job super exciting. And we want to make sure that we can broadcast those capabilities and really engage with as many companies as we can to scale up that race against carbon as fast as we can. Um, okay, so um, I, thank you very much, Philippe. We have... Um... We have had a fascinating uh, perspectives from uh, our panelists. Um, make sure to tune in uh, to Infra, Channel, Infra Challenges uh, on uh, Thursday to find out about the new types of, of global innovations that be, are being developed on infrastructure. And I hope that our participants are taking to heart the, um, the call for actions from our startups and from Schneider Electric. Thank you all for joining.